Let's get started. Call to order the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting for November 20th, 2012. The first item on our agenda are minutes of the prior meeting. Does anyone have any comments on the minutes from the prior meeting? Anyone want to make a motion? Would we accept the minutes of the October 16th meeting as presented? Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, that's unanimous for those of us who are here. Thank you. So the first item on our agenda is the Fort Williams Park site improvements. The Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting review of four areas of site improvements implementing the master plan, specifically expansion of Ship Cove parking, upgrade of the Ship Cove picnic area slab, vehicular improvements at the intersection of Ocean Road and Wheatley Road, and vehicular and pedestrian improvements at the intersection of Powers Road and Ship Cove parking lot entrance drive and Ocean Road. Site plan review, public hearing. So, if you want to come forward, I guess John Mitchell's going to address us tonight and, uh, and explain what has been changed from the last meeting, if you would. Okay. To the next slide. There have only been, a, um, well, first of all, we've, we've addressed all of, the, all of uh, the comments provided by AMAC. Um, and the latest comments by AMAC, there are only a couple. Uh, one was to redesign this little island here to allow an emergency vehicle to uh, maneuver onto that, um, onto that island and um, access Keys, Keys Road. So we have done that. Uh, we've kept the walkway and we've provided stabilized pavers on either side of the walkway to allow an emergency vehicle to, to uh, circulate. So that was one change. The other change that was requested was to remove this one space that exists today. Um, it's a undersized parking space, uh, so we agreed to do that. So we have a total of, uh, a total of 70 parking spaces now in this uh, expanded parking lot. Uh, the board, one of the members of the board asked us to uh, install a one-way sign in the circle, which we have done. <coughs> um, other than that, there, there really aren't any other changes. Uh, OK. Before we open the public hearing, does anyone on the board have any clarifying questions? All right, then we do have a public hearing on this proposal tonight, which is now open. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this application? Come right on forward, thank you. Different application, okay, that's fine. We'll get to that one shortly. Okay, seeing no one who wishes to speak on this application, the public hearing is closed. Do any board members have any questions or anything you'd like to discuss? Hi. members of the public know that we've discussed it in workshops. And at a prior meeting also. The only thing I noticed, John, is that there was a letter from the town engineers dated subsequent to the date of your proposal that talked about adding some more dimensioning to the parking spaces. I'm sorry. Looked yeah, to me was... like it's already there. Is it? It is. Um, she was referring to these two uh, handicapped parking spaces, which we've done. The reason I didn't dimension them is because they exist today and we're not changing anything. So, But, but I've added dimensions to them. Oh, yeah. great. That was the only minor thing. All right, would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Henry? That will be an order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of town Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of proposed improvements to Fort Williams Park, specifically expansion 
and construction of a turnabout in the Ship Cove parking lot, upgrade of the Ship Cove picnic area slab, vehicular improvements at the intersection of Ocean Road and Whitley Road, and vehicular and pedestrian improvements at the intersection of Powers Road and Ship Cove parking lot entrance drive be approved, subject to the following conditions. That the remnant existing asphalt located on the left land side of the Ship Cove parking lot currently shown as an undersized parking lot be removed. Two, that the walkway access to Keys Road from the Ship Cove parking lot be revised to provide turning radius and width to accommodate the ladder track. But three, that the plans be revised to address the above conditions before construction of improvements is commenced. Before I ask for a second, Henry, did you intend to include the findings of facts prior? Oh, uh, sorry. I did. Finding of fact, the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting site plan review of proposed improvements to Fort Williams Park, specifically expansion and construction of a turnaround on the Ship Cove parking lot, upgrade, upgrade of the Ship Cove picnic area slab, vehicular improvements at the intersection of Ocean Road and Whitley Road, and vehicular and pedestrian improvements at the intersection of Powers Road and the Ship Cove parking lot entrance drive, which required review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, town staff has noted revisions to the ship code parking lot design. And three, the applicant subsequently compiled with set, complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Joe, any discussion? All in favor? That's six of us unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the... Next item on our agenda, C's Gourmet Market Site Plan, KMC Properties is requesting site plan review of a proposed mixed-use specialty market, 28-seat restaurant and office building, 4,140 square feet, located at 349 Ocean House Road, Section 19.9, Site Plan Public Hearing. This is also something that we discussed at our last meeting, and we have had a site walk. So if the applicant would like to review what has changed since our last meeting and anything that might reflect the results of the site walk, we can then proceed after that. Set? It's loading. Okay. Oh. Ah, coming up. There we go. Okay. So I, I'm sorry. You you want me to just review some of the changes, uh, the changes that have been made, as from the last submission, as well yes. as the items that we addressed during the site walk? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I would also note that we have received a couple of letters. I assume you have copies, and if you want to go ahead and, identify and respond to some of the questions in the letters from the Blakes, you might go ahead and do that, too. Okay. All right. Um, Yes, we have, uh, well, first of all, John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates, and we represent uh, KMC LLC, which is um, Michael and Stephanie Concannon, who are here this evening, as well as Mark Mueller from Mark Mueller Architects and Tom Goro from uh, Goro Palmer Traffic Engineers. Um, yes, we are in receipt of the, uh, the letter from... Um, the, uh, the Abada, Andrew, and Rachel Blake, uh, who abut the property. And um, 
Uh, we have you know we I, I want to I want to try to address their comments as I go through some of the presentation rather than going through point by point that makes uh, sense yeah and um, and we do appreciate their comments uh, we have been uh, sensitive to the fact that there is a, uh, a residential use that abuts this property. Um, and the Concannons have always mentioned that they want to be good neighbors. <clears throat> but we also have to remember that we're all in the town center zone. We're in the town center zone. All of our abutters are in the town center zone. And um, in fact, the town center zone extends all the way down to Fall Road. And as I read the, uh, the purpose statement in the town center, in the ordinance under the town center zone, uh, what it emphasizes is that, that development in the town center zone encourages a village feeling with mixed retail and residential use in a common meeting place. So I just want to make sure that we all keep that in mind. Um, the building <clears throat> is a 3,000 square foot uh, first floor or footprint um, with approximately 1,500 square feet on the second floor. Uh, it is located in the, uh, the northeast corner or portion of the property um, with the service and commercial part of the building located on the north side and a patio for outdoor seating uh, located on the south side. Uh, the building has been located uh, as close or, or within 25 feet of the uh, front setback to provide a strong uh, street presence. There are a number of uh, entrances to the building, I, I think a total of five. The main entrance or the front entrance is off of Ocean House Road in this location. There's a, a door that accesses the, uh, the patio. The door that uh, most of the customers from the parking lot will enter in this location. There's a door that will access the second story here and a service door. Can you, can you point out the service door again? Yes, there's a, there's a mix. Right there. Okay. Right there. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Access to the property, the primary access is off of Ocean House Road in this location. Uh, this location has uh, historically been the access to this property. Uh, we have shifted it um, approximately five or six feet away from the property line uh, to provide a, a little bit more uh, green space in, in the corner there. Uh, but it, it provides access to the, to the parking lot, which is located in the rear of the building to minimize its impact on Ocean House Road. And then there's a secondary access uh, that we are proposing uh, onto the high school driveway. Uh, there are pedestrian circulation. We're providing a, a new concrete uh, sidewalk along Ocean House Road that will connect to an existing sidewalk here as well as another sidewalk uh, that will lead to the, uh, the rear of the building. Uh, utilities, uh, the, the project or the site is well serviced by uh, existing public utilities. We're bringing the uh, the water in off of Ocean House Road, the sanitary sewer, there's already a stub to the site uh, in this location here. And the electric telephone and cable will go underground from uh, this utility pole uh, across the high school driveway and into the building. Uh, we're also proposing an underground propane tank located uh, roughly in this location. Um, Stormwater, we are collecting, uh, I think, probably 90% of the runoff from the site. Uh, they're being collected uh, with catch basins and storm drain pipes that will then connect to existing, the existing storm drain system in the high school parking lot. Um, 
Lighting, there are a total of seven parking lot fixtures. Uh, there are two uh, located along the main access drive here, and then the ballots are located around the parking lot. Uh, these are 60-watt uh, LED fixtures on 12-foot high poles. Um, other than security lighting, um, they will be on a timer and turned off at night. In addition to those seven, there are uh, two town center light fixtures, one located here and one located here, which will be installed in the uh, grass esplanade. While you're on the lighting fixtures, can you talk about the direction of the lighting? Yes. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the show, there is, I, I've included the photometric plan, which okay. I'd like to address. I'll just say that um, in your submission package, in your most rec recent submission package, I have revised the light standards. Um, and this one I had to uh, move from, it was originally located here to provide adequate lighting at the entrance. I had to shift that in this direction. And then this fixture, which was located here, I had to shift to here. Um, and the reason for that was to get the, uh, the half a foot candle or lower at the property lines. Great, thank you. And um, I don't know if you, if you in, my, in my cover letter, I, I indicated that I disagree with this because that, that um, well, there will be less illumination at, at the two important points and those at the entry points. But we've done it to, uh, to uh, get the half a foot candle. Um, if the board can provide a waiver, we'd like to move these fixtures back to the original locations. Um, there's a sign, a, a very small uh, freestanding sign located here, which is 15, set 15 feet back from uh, the right of way line. Uh, that sign will be illuminated by two small up lights. <coughs> um, there are a number of plants, um, trees, shrubs, ground cover that are located throughout the property. Uh, we've, we've preserved uh, a lot of the trees that are located in, in this corner of the property. Uh, we're providing uh, small deciduous trees in the parking lot as well as along the main access drive. Um, there will be a tree located in the curvature of the walk here. There'll be uh, a number of uh, sh shrubs, uh, flowering shrubs, um, as well as uh, additional plantings along this uh, strip here. Uh, and we've got a row of lilac uh, trees which will help buffer the parking lot from the school property. Uh, a dumpster, uh, we've, the exterior dumpster is located here. Um, the dumpster will be uh, screened with a wood fence uh, as well as a wood gate. Um, there are two easements, uh, one for the sidewalk because um, a portion of the sidewalk goes on to private property, and the other easement is a access and utility easement which will encompass this area of the high school driveway um, to, to have the right to access onto that uh, driveway as well as to bring utilities across. Uh, in terms of buffering, uh, we have, as a result of the site walk, the abutter, uh, Andrew Blake, asked us to, if we would replace the stockade fence, we, fence which we agreed to do, so there'll be a new six foot high uh, stockade fence which r runs along this property line. Um, they also asked us if we could plant some additional evergreen, broadleaf evergreen shrubs right in this corner of the property where um, it is somewhat visible from the access drive looking into um, their property. So we've agreed to 
provide uh, their catawba rhododendrons, which grow, they're, eventually they'll grow, you know, 10 feet, 10, 12 feet high. Um, so we have provided a grouping of three rhododendrons in this location here. And do you, are you going to get an easement for there's, them? There's a letter in your packet, I believe, um, right. from the Blakes um, agreeing okay. to allowing us put, to put the shrubs there. But not a formal easement? No. Okay. No. Uh, just one other thing on the patio. The patio, uh, there was a question during the site walk uh, from Andrew Blake about uh, the elevation of the patio, and I just want to I just want to clarify that the patio is at the same elevation as the floor of the, of the building, which is 80, and the patio is somewhat less than that. It's six inches less. But um, that, is the, uh, that is the approximate location of the abutting residence. So it's, um, there was some concern about the patio looking down onto their property, but it, it actually is uh, level. Um, we also, on the patio, we're providing a small circular stone wall around the patio. Uh, there'll be a lattice style fence um, that will go along a portion of that curvature. And, um, and then on the fence, uh, we're proposing to grow uh, climbing hydrangeas, which will provide some additional um, screening, as well as some additional plants that we're planting um, along the main access drive. So, um, yes. Uh, John, you, you showed your plan those four trees or crabapple trees. How high do they get at mature height? Those will grow to 25 feet. Okay, so that will be screening, additional screening when they're mature? Yes, <clears throat> yes. Yep. Um, so it, at this point, um, I want to turn it over to Mark, uh, who will go through. I didn't find it. Uh, well, let me, I'm sorry. Let me just go to uh, the photometric plan. Um, OK, so it's, it's difficult to, to read the numbers, but um, you can see it in your packet um, that right here it's a half a foot candle or less. Um, it's all zero foot candles along the property line and it is a half a foot candle or less along this property line uh, by shifting those two light fixtures. Or any questions on that uh, or anything that I've reviewed? Do we have the authority to vary? Um, section 19-9-5 are the standards and uh, the traditional interpretation is that you do not have the authority to, wa to waive standards. You have the authority to waive submission requirements but you still have to make a finding that it meets the standards. Okay. So even if there seemed to be some safety benefit to allowing additional lighting at the entrance, generally we don't have the discretion to. Generally you don't. Okay. Oops. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I, are, are you gonna do a little architectural? One through three. Um, I, I guess, you know, if you want to listen to Mark and, and listen to some of the, the changes that have been made, or do you want a full presentation on the architect? I would just basically, I think we basically want to focus on the changes. I think it might be useful to put up there the elevations like you've, you've got, just so that members of the public will have those in front of them. I also want to say for the benefit of the planning board, 
and also to confirm with you that the elevations have not changed since our last meeting and the floor plan has not changed, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so in the information that you received in your most recent mailing, the elevations and the floor plans were not included because they have not changed. So you should look up there to reference them there at the end of our last packet, sheets A1 and A2. Get to the uh, am I doing wrong? Right. Oh. oh, what are you doing? It, it's just jumping around. A lighter touch, huh? Lighter touch. jumps it's 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 the slide bef before this before one. this one yeah. Yeah, let's just do this yeah. I think because um, there's some laden data okay is it is it this the one you want um, it's the one yeah is this it Mark that's it yeah. Hello, my name is Mark Mueller. I was here last time to uh, review this project, and so we're, we're back again. Um, you know, Elaine, as you'd mentioned, there really have been no changes, and so uh, we have, um, I think we've thought a little bit about, you know, color. Um, I do have some material samples with me this evening if, if we'd like to look at those. Um, yeah, I know you had interest in them last time. Um, the other thing is, I know last time you didn't specifically address the town center design standards, and if you could just run through those quickly, that would be helpful. Okay. I know you, they're addressed in the letter that you submitted, and I appreciate that. I think the, uh, the, the main thing that we really worked towards was the, um, you know, the scale of the building and, and, and the facade, which is the bottom. That, that, that facade there faces Ocean House Road. And so there we really worked hard. We looked at some of the neighbors. There's two houses, two projects locally that, that we had looked at as part of our, is that our, like our street facade. Um, and this, um, I guess the main thing was the facade dimensions. Uh, we've looked at trying to create a main, a main presence. Again, it's a simple gable shape. And the, um, we looked at building articulation and height. And so we really tried to, Tried to, tried to work with the proportions of the shape. Um, we, we probably could have made this a little simpler project to, to build if we'd have made it taller. But we looked at um, you know, keeping it at one story. All the origination of the roofs are low. And so therefore, the second story is, um, you know, is dormers. Um, we looked at the, uh, you know, the openings. Um, you know, the ordinance talks about equal equal openings of wall and window. And so looking at, at the main facade there, we're, we're, not, quite, we're not quite at 50%, but uh, there, is, there is a large proportion of window, window and uh, glass there to, to the wall. <clears throat> the main entrance is, uh, that John had mentioned is, is all glass, has sort of a kind of a barn door, transom sort of appearance to it. And along with, to get our proportions up, we, we have some sliding uh, sliding barn doors that uh, sort of add to um, the presence of, you know, fenestration. The wall surfaces are, um, you know, a clapboard. We've talked about two different materials, uh, not different materials, but two different sizes and width of materials. We have sort of a lower base that would, um, you know, become a, a wider sort of a rough side type of, um, you know, clapboard. And the upper base would be, you know, a narrow, more of a traditional sort of width, width of um, siding. Uh, last time we, 
I think the roof pitch was in question last time. So uh, we have an 812 roof pitch. Uh, the dormer is a little bit less than that, but the, you know, the main presence, the, the dominant shape of the building is, is 812. Now the roof is, um, is going to be an asphalt type um, material. Uh, some of the project, historic projects we work on in Portland, uh, there's a few products that, that seem to work well for that and, and we'd propose using that. It's, uh, it's a certain teed hatteras type of shingle. Uh, again, it's a weather, strong weather resistant shingle, but it has more of a historic um, you know, lines to it as opposed to sort of the synthetic type, type slate material. Now the color of the building is, um, you know, this is sort of just a, a quick rendition. There's not a whole lot of shadow and detail to it, but as of right now, the main idea is a, is a white, white building, green windows, and, um, and then white trim. And then the roof would be a mid-tone, a mid-tone gray roof. I guess are these materials something that I can pass around, or how does that? Sure, if you have some materials you want to pass down, that'd be great. Samples come around the, um, the the rough the rough board to be more um, similar to the material or color that we're actually looking at. So the, the little sample then would be a just just a window color. So the whole it's basically a white window, a white building I should say. And the um, just little you know slight accents of green. The roof is meant to be sort of a subtle recessive type of element. I guess any other questions that uh, address? Um... No, I think that addresses the, the town center design standards. And I think the, the other aspects of it, John, I think pretty much you picked up in your yeah. original presentation, the orientation, the parking orientation, all of that. Yes. So um, we've addressed um, all of the comments from AMAC. Um, uh, including the most recent comment was, uh, I believe, was to add uh, tree preservation notes to the plan, which we've done um, on, on the layout plan. Um, the sidewalk easement has been revised and submitted, I believe, Maureen. Um, the uh, applicant's attorney and the town's attorney have been exchanging emails today, and I, I got a confirmation that the uh, easement drafted by the town attorney that we works we we approved of the applicant's attorney is now approved of. So all we need to do is sign that. But there's also a second easement for the access on the school drive, and that's that's a separate easement that has been um, approved by the town council. And if you want specific information about that, I do see the town manager in the audience in case anyone has any questions. I guess I was just wondering if completion of that is something that should be a condition, but I suppose we can get to that later. Okay. Uh, the photometric plan, as I mentioned, has been revised to uh, conform to the, to the uh, standards. Uh, the town center design standards have been documented and uh, one thing that I did not mention was that we have incorporated a bike rack or two bike racks uh, located right there. Um, and I think that that uh, concludes our presentation. As I mentioned, uh, Tom Gorrell is here if you have any questions regarding traffic. Thank you. All right. I'm I know that the planning board has a number of questions that we wanted to ask the traffic engineer. I wonder if it might be helpful to the public 
if we went ahead and had the traffic engineer make his presentation so the public comments would be able to address that also. So, it's a little bit different than our usual order, but I think it would be helpful. Sure. A lot of us have those questions. All right, Madam Chairman, members of the board, my name is Tom Goral. I'm a traffic engineer with Goral Palmer Consulting Engineers, and we did complete the traffic impact study for the project. The, um, you know, we, as typical for a traffic impact study, we count the amount of traffic that's on the roadway and estimate the amount of traffic that would be generated by the development and add the two together and assess what the impacts of that would be. Um, this uh, particular store is um, what we do as traffic engineers is normally um, consult something that's a national standard known as the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation. And there's, it's a big fat book, there's a lot of land use codes in that. None of them really conform to this. This is a, a little bit different in terms of it's a fairly specialized specialty market. And so when we don't have something that's really models what we're proposing uh, well, we go out and count something that's similar. And that's what we did. We went up to um, actually Wyndham, the Good Life Market, up on, well, it's actually in Raymond, I should say, on 302, um, corner of 302 and 85, I think it is, is the Good Life Market. So we went up there and counted that. And uh, that's how we came up with our trip generation. Um, those are estimates, obviously, but they should be in the ballpark. And we ended up with an AM peak hour volume of about 50, or excuse me, 46 uh, trip ends. And in the um, middle of the afternoon, which is generally the peak for the school and the store, it's about 54. A trip end is either an in or an out. So if I make a round trip, I have two trip ends. Um, what that ends up being, if you um, look at the trip assignment, and we did submit a traffic impact study to you, is um, we um, essentially had 13 left turns into the site um, during the AM peak hour and about 11 into the site during the PM peak hour. Um, and so that's over a period of an hour off the Ocean House Road. And we um, did have um, about 15, 13 in the uh, morning and 15 in the afternoon exiting onto the school driveway. So that's basically uh, about one every four minutes that would be doing that. We combined that traffic <coughs> with the traffic that's already at the existing intersection, which is signalized, as you know, and um, that um, worked pretty well to level of service um, A. Now, there are certainly times where I'm sure it doesn't seem like it's a, a very good level of service. And I've been out there. We had, you know, uh, people that, within our office that counted, but I also went out and just observed it because sometimes that's helpful and not actually be counting. And it, it does um, at times back up, um, and you've probably seen it back up further, but it seemed to back up um, to within a car length anyway of the uh, driveway that would be on uh, the school driveway. I, when you're on a corner like this, it is kind of nice to have access to the side street. That's what you, you know, would desire. Um, that doesn't uh, block the driveway, at least. Um, and again, that's typically like all school sites. Um, they're kind of hectic for 15, 20 minutes in the morning, 15 to 20 minutes in the afternoon, and then things are in pretty good shape after that. So it didn't block the driveway, um, and uh, so I guess um, that's, that's really the take on that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a question. The, did you look at uh, Ocean Harris Road, the, ex, the entry, which is on ent entry exit shown on this map at the moment, on traffic turning left as it came out of the parking lot, once it did turn left, is onto a, a section where it has to cross over from a left only part to a right to, a, to get to carry straight on. 
Yeah. You had the crossover, a turn left only section. If yeah. It, it was a bit heavy on there. So looking at this, at this map, would it not be, would it not be practical to have a right only turn at that main enter, enter left or right, but right only exit? You're talking about Ocean House Road. Ocean House Road, yeah. where exiting on Ocean House Road, yeah. you only go right. And where exiting onto the high school entrance would go left and or right. In other words, making it essentially somewhat of a rotary. And therefore, if you wanted to go um, or left on Ocean House Road, you'd come out the side road, go up to the traffic lights, which would hold you up or let you through, and you'd turn left without, rather than turn across incoming traffic on that road. Uh, did you look at that? That's yeah, we didn't look at that specifically. I guess, um, you know, we tend to like to sort of dilute the traffic a bit, and um, I, I didn't see any real issues, and I don't want to poke anybody in the eye here, but uh, with allowing that left. This is, this is painted as a, as a left turn lane, I, I agree. What the critical thing for us as we looked at it was to look at the distance that we have for storage here and see whether that driveway was blocked, and um, it wasn't. Um, I wouldn't, it had good sight lines. So we really didn't see the, the reason. Um, you could do, as you're talking about, kind of you know, chase them around that way. Um, but I, I, uh, I would think just distributing the traffic, um, you know, having those options to be able to turn left on the Ocean House Road. I don't really see a problem with that. And again, a lot of the time, um, it's not a big issue anyway, because um, it's really a, you know, 15, 20 minute issue in the morning is the, the biggest time, so. My main concern is um, people cutting through the parking lot. Yep. Impatient yep. teen drivers yep. uh, don't want to wait for the light, race through the parking lot, sure. and then make a crazy left turn um, onto Ocean House Road, or, you know, make a right turn. But, yep. um, did you think about that? And um, if so, how do you plan to address it? We have thought about that. Um, in terms of uh, you know, the layout that they, they do have here, um, and I understand what you're talking about, racing through, and um, I, I think with the turns that they need to make, it's going to be a little hard to like go diagonally across, which is where a lot of times like in a shopping center or something you see people kind of, particularly if that parking isn't occupied, so that's where the, the racing happens as opposed to really having to go down and make that corner and, and go across. There's a potential for that, um, absolutely. What can we do about it? it? You can do signage, you can uh, I think the layout they have for the parking lot is probably the, you know, the best they can do with that. We look at trying to make things somewhat circuitous, and I think they've <coughs> done the best they can with that. You also can put things that I prefer not to do, things like speed bumps and that, but that's kind of, you know, a last resort type of thing. Um, so I guess I wouldn't see that here. Um, What's Not the sure. downside of a speed bump? You're going to spill your coffee for one thing. <laughs> but the downside is, is really just the disruption to the vehicle. You can put speed bumps in. Um, you know, if you were going to put them, you'd do something probably back in, in that area um, where you hit them, you know, traverse them squarely. Um, but they do present sometimes uh, maintenance issues, such as, um, you know, you do have a drain. It's kind of a, a barrier to, to drainage. It's also um, a bit of a maintenance headache for plowing. And um, I, we laugh a little bit about spilling the coffee, but um, I've done a lot of speed bumps. We were some of the first ones to do that, and people... Um, People do have issues with that happening at times, spilling stuff and such. I always, I guess, tend to take sort of a, a wait and see on to see if it really tends to be a problem. Um, they also have things that are more portable today that you take up and you put down as opposed to some that are permanent. Um, 
there's companies that do just that sort of thing. So I hate to solve a problem before it exists, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and um, I totally share that sentiment about solving before it exists, but um, if the problem does develop, I'm not sure what recourse we have um, as a town to do something about it after the fact. Maybe, Maureen, that's something you can help us with. I know. So your concern, Liza, with the safety of the parking lot, is that how you would look at it, that the parking yeah, lot I think, would become unsafe? I think, yeah, I think people are, drivers cutting exactly. Through? I think drivers are going to cut through at a high speed. And it will be sort of an outlet for their frustration. I mean, I just see it jogging up and down Shore Road or riding my bike when, um, it's, when people have an outlet and they can sort of, they haven't, you know, once they, once they pass you, they speed up. I, I don't know, it, there's probably a, some, a name for the human condition, but I think people might go faster than they otherwise would if they had to wait for the light. Well, I also wondered if the, um for traffic leaving the high school, uh, not only in the school day, but for things like sports events or prom, you know, big functions, the traffic light, you know, is, has its times, and the traffic does tend to back up on the roadway leading out to uh, the main street. And I can see people very easily just flipping through the parking lot to bypass the light, and that, somehow something doesn't sound quite right. Are you saying you could put up a portable barricade for special events to keep that from happening? No, it's not so much I wasn't referring to a barricade as much as the, the question I think had, uh, you were asking more about the speed bump sort of thing. And speed bumps can be permanent, but they also can be portable uh, where you put them down and you can take them up because they're just devices you put on top of the road. So that's what I was clarifying there is that, you know, because of maintenance and all those sorts of things. Plus it speaks to maybe not solving the problem before it does exist. In terms of your question of, of special events, um, you know, that's also something you can look at pretty closely with the traffic light because the traffic lights are pretty smart these days. Um, so they sense the traffic a lot better than they used to. They sh um, can be programmed, you know, for if there are events that happen that are relatively regular in terms of special events, it can be programmed with a special plan. Um, but it also, in periods where the traffic is heavier on the side street um, and the traffic light on the main street, you can look at a, again, kind of a special plan where you give a little bit more time to the side street, there's a, like a maximum that you, there's a minimum max and a passage time and all those sorts of things. And you can adjust those to give the side street a little bit more time um, during those periods to try to flush that traffic out a little bit quicker. Maury, do you know if that traffic light is traffic sensing? I'm looking at the manager and he's nodding yes. Traffic action. Can, can I ask, um, maybe you're not aware, but perhaps the town manager is, in the discussions with the town council about using this high school roadway as access to this property, were traffic issues discussed and any of these concerns about cut through traffic addressed? Because in some ways it seems to be as much a trespass issue as, as anything else. Um, so I'm wondering if, if there's anything in the easement intended to address that or? The, the town council did early on discuss the concern with cut through traffic, uh, decided that it was much more preferable to try to encourage people to go out by the light. The, the thought was that people would consider it much safer to go out by the light, uh, having experienced it with a light and without a light and looking at the traffic actuated nature of the traffic light, it is so much safer now to go out by the traffic light and yes, you may have a few people that come out the other way, but uh, that was essentially the way the council evaluated it. And that was in early discussions when this came up in January. At the most recent discussion, uh, where the, the town council confirmed exactly what they were giving at, at a meeting uh, last week, uh, the, the issue of traffic was touched on ever so lightly and basically with the thought that the, it's the responsibility of the planning board uh, to review the traffic issues and not the town council. Okay. So they, they more or less deferred, they, they did defer to the planning board 
on the specific aspects of trafficking. Thank you. Carol Ann. Yeah, I talk about um, how to how to deal with it if it should if the if it should arise. And I don't know this for an actual fact, but I have anecdotal evidence that it it does occur. I believe it is illegal to cut through a parking lot to avoid a traffic light. I actually know someone who has been stopped for that. I have one question, if I may. Henry? What, we're trying to back off from this. What is the advantage of having this secondary entry exit on the high school uh, entrance road? I mean, to me, it seems like it's coming out from school. Ah, oh, let's go grab a sandwich. We'll take a, a right onto into that parking lot. That seems its main advantage. Other than that, why, when you have a main entrance, do you want two entrances to this area? The majority of people actually, um, we would anticipate to turn left or to, to want to, um, you know, coming out of the school driveway or coming out of the site driveway onto Ocean House. They, the majority of them would turn left. The, uh, the advantage of this, having the driveway onto the school um, is that the people can turn right, get in the left turn lane, and, and have the light for a, you know, predictable um, gap, if you will, to get onto Ocean House Road. If you're coming out onto the unsignalized driveway on Ocean House Road, they've just, it's unsignalized. They don't have a traffic signal to let them out. So it's just more predictable to come out where there is a traffic light to control them and give them an ability Sorry, to turn I, left. I don't follow that. I'm not sure that, but um, I take a point. But I mean, I, I see that if you come out the main entrance and you want to go down, 77 or Ocean House Road towards the center of town, mm -hmm. you end up by having to pass through a traffic light. In, in actual fact, whichever way you go, you've got to pass through a traffic light. Once, but, you went to this, once you went to the parking lot, exiting it, other than taking a right out of that main line, you have to go through the traffic light. Okay, I misunderstood maybe. I thought you were asking, well, you know. That one, the school entrance. Yep. So you like to, why is it there? That's if that's not if that's not there, I have to take a left at an unsignalized driveway onto Ocean House Road, and I don't have a light to do that. So there's a light that exists, Wait, which has. Sorry, you have to take to come out at the bottom one. You have to take a left, and it's unsignalized. Is that what you're saying? Right. Correct. But it's also unsignalized on the other side. Both of them this, are signalized. The only the only but, light. Ocean House Road. The access on Ocean House Road is unsignalized at the driveway that goes directly on Ocean House Road. It's signalized if you have to get onto the high school driveway first. Right. The amount of traffic on the high school driveway is a much lower amount than the amount of traffic on Ocean House Road. So it's the turn onto Ocean House Road that's the real challenge. Is that fair? Uh, yes, so it, yes, it is, correct. The other thing that, that occurs to me um, is that with the access onto the high school driveway, service traffic, the servicing of the dumpster, the bringing of supplies, all of that service aspect of the building is located close to the high school driveway away from the residents. And that means that the disturbance by service trucks is towards the more commercial part of the property and away from the residential part of the property, which seems to me to be a good thing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, it seems to me a lot of the concern is not um, traffic leaving the parking lot to Ocean House Road via the, the highway street, uh, the side street, but traffic coming into the parking lot from the side street. And typically in the process of leaving the high school from school or an event. And that to me is the part that has a little bit of concern because that traffic is effectively using the parking lot as a bypass for the light. Is there any, would it make any sense to make that a one way, in other words, a point of egress but not access? Um, egress onto the high school driveway. Yes, but not access to the parking lot from the high school driveway. Sort of an exit only, yeah. not an entrance. Yes. Well, then the service vehicles couldn't. Yeah, with the but exception other than of service, yeah, yeah. I talk about the main, you know, normal, everyday civilian traffic and the, the concern that they might come whipping off the side street from the high school and just use it as a. 
I mean, they, they could do that, and I'm not, I'm not sure that they would do that, but it's, it's a possibility that they would. Again, I would think some of the customers, though, and then for convenience, um, it would be nice. We, we try to do interconnectivity today <coughs> so that you can, in fact, get into this property without actually going out onto, onto Ocean House Road because that just adds congestion. So that, you know, granted it's a right turn to turn onto Ocean and then turn back into the driveway, but why not just turn directly off the school driveway into the site? That's convenient for them. Yeah, you need to balance that with cut through traffic, but I would think that would be something that, um, I'm, I don't know, but I'm sure the store owner doesn't want that either. So I think they'd probably be pretty proactive in trying to, to uh, limit that. I think that's a neat idea. I was actually thinking the opposite. So you can go into the store from 77, but you can't go out on, directly onto 77. You have to go through the high school access road. You want to make it into a road tree, that's what you're saying. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, a road tree is only one, yes. one way around. Yes. You could go in or out, though, from that high school. From the side. Yeah. Hmm. But I think that's a really neat idea. Well, I mean, if, if it, I, I agree with you. Let's, we don't know if we have a problem because we haven't seen it happening on the ground. But if it becomes a problem, how do you see it getting fixed? Well, well as I said, I think um, not having interconnectivity can create some issues. That's one of the things that, you know, is emerging, has emerged, that, you know, sometimes we, we try to over-engineer those sorts of things. If a problem does develop, then um, again, I would think that um, sure you try signage, but how effective is that going to be? You know, that's one method you can certainly try. The other thing is that you do try some kind of traffic calming. Um, you know, you try to define when that problem is happening too, um, because that may just be a particular time of day, and so that's you'd look at one set of things which may be just an enforcement sort of thing to, to catch that if it's just a certain period or if it's just certain people then there are measures that you can take if it starts to happen in general then yeah you might look at a, a portable uh, speed bump that sort of thing but um, I would tend to think the benefits of the interconnectivity uh, you would want to realize. Any other Questions before we open the public hearing? I have a question about the um, lighting. I know um, John Mitchell had said that if possible, for safety reasons, you would like the lights closer to the um, entrance edge uh, property line, you know, at the road. And um, what is the, what's the specific safety reason for that? And um, are reflective materials an option if, it, if there's a strong safety? reason for moving the lights towards the edge of the property. Yeah, I've had too much to do with lighting, John. You're, in terms of, you've had more to do with that than I have. I mean, generally, we want it well lit for pedestrians. I mean, that's a, actually, that's a requirement that this project doesn't require traffic movement from DOT because it doesn't generate enough traffic. But you, you do want a certain amount of pedestrian or roadside lighting so that, you know, from a that's a condition that they usually place on it to make sure that uh, the pedestrians and cars can can interact. But yeah. I haven't. The reflective materials wouldn't help in that case. You know, again, I guess I'm going to refer to you a little bit more on that. I've been too much involved in that. For example, what, what were you thinking? I was just wondering. You were saying, oh, if we could, we would move the lights closer to the edge of the property. Right. Right. And I was just wondering why. What were the safety reasons? It sounds like pedestrian access is one of them. Um, so cars could see the pedestrian. Yeah, pedestrian and, you know, it's just uh, by having a little bit more than a half a foot candle at the entrances, we'll, we'll start to, you know, to uh, identify where those entrances are, is for the vehicle moving in each direction. Gotcha. Because it sounds like we have no leeway on the foot candles, but I was thinking, I mean, maybe you could add reflective materials if marking the entrance for the cars was important. Mm -hmm. Is there headlights sweep by? Oh, it's just a thought. Any thoughts on that? Anyway, it's not, I mean, okay. Yeah. Well, let's open it for a public hearing at this point, and then we can ask other questions as we might want to to 
respond to that and any other questions we might have on the plans. So is there any member of the public who wishes to speak? I'll open the public hearing now. Just come right on forward. Give us your name and your address when you come up. Rory Strunk, Six Tides Edge Road. Just a little comment on the, on the traffic. Uh, I live on Shore Road. It would be very easy for me to cut through this parking lot and cut on the 77 if I wanted to you know, avoid the mess here. And there's a lot of people who know this. And I don't think it's usually used as a, as a thoroughfare. I mean, it's kind of a common sense. So I think in, in, in all reality, people would come to a common sense approach on it. So. That's my feeling on your opinion. I use the cut through. <laughs> so you, you, you be the infractor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Come right on up. At some point, I'd like to go back to the uh, elevation on the building. Can you introduce yourself and, oh, and give us your Excuse me. My name's uh, Richard Blake. I live on Ivy Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm here representing Andrew Blake, who is my son, and it's sort of an ongoing uh, relationship. I've been managing the property for Mrs. Reich uh, for over 30 years until she sold it to my son last uh, November 6th. And so I was re corresponding with the planning board regarding this project, and I'm just continuing that uh, correspondence on his behalf. Thank you. We do have two letters, I believe. I uh, sent one for Mrs. Reich, and then we reformatted it and for Andrew, and he was part of both of those letters uh, since we knew he was buying the property uh, seven or eight months ago. We have a letter dated October 29th, and then a letter dated November 15th. Yeah, and there's probably one back in May, uh, December uh, 2011 also. Yeah, the, the October one, I think, related to the plantings of three plants, uh, the three shrubs, on uh, uh, Andrew's property. And my presentation might be, or my discussion might be a little disjointed. I've been writing notes down as we've been going through things, so I've lost the flow of what I uh, wanted to talk about. But uh, one of the things I was hoping to see more of tonight uh, was the, uh, in the, the information on the building. I understand there was a meeting. We weren't notified of that. I guess the notices go to the reaches. They're in their 90s and 80s, live in Connecticut. By the time they process them and send them back, I wasn't able to attend that meeting. Uh, it would have been nice to have some notice of it. <clears throat> but I think you've seen the letters. Mm -hmm. They're pretty consistent. There's a lot of concerns. Um, and, you know, we realize that something's going to be done there. Uh, that building certainly looks a lot better than the building that previously existed there several years ago before it was torn down. Uh, the dimensions and the scale look nice as long as it complies with the town center zoning in terms of the, uh, the materials, the windows, and things like that. The continued concern is uh, there's sort of three or four items. Um, the lighting, 12-foot um, lights sound perfectly fine. They don't seem too high. That's only two feet over a basketball rim. But it would be nice if that light did not reflect over the fence onto Andrew's land. And there has to be some way of shielding that light and focusing it down rather than having it go 360 degrees. Uh, so hopefully that could be a consideration uh, on the lighting. Uh, the buffering, I think, I haven't read the town center zone for quite a while, but it talks about adequate buffering. Uh, at this point, we do not believe there is adequate buffering. The fence, is the existing fence, needs to be repaired and replaced, which is great. The piece up near the driveway drops from six feet to four feet. Uh, raising it back to six will provide some additional coverage. Uh, however, we think there needs to be more buffering, and the primary concern for the buffering is the patio. Uh, I talked about the elevation being the same elevation as the house. Uh, that's a concern because any noise will carry straight across, and I think that'll be above the six-foot fence. And we think the plan ought to have more buffering around the patio area, replace those three or four trees that are deciduous with evergreens that are there year-round uh, and provide both, both light and noise. I'm not sure there's any music going to be piped out onto this patio. We would hope not. Um, 
but we have concerns there. Sign lighting, uh, we hope that is on the same timer we had heard on a previous discussion, having a 7.30 turnoff. We would hope the sign lighting would not be on all evening also, or all night. Uh, the dumpster, um, I've lived in an urban location. I've lived in some projects in uh, other areas where there, there are dumpsters. The dumpster trucks always come at 5.30 in the morning. They are not quiet. They are not considerate of the neighbors. So hopefully something can be done to restrict the hours of the time emptying of the dumpster beyond 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning to give people uh, time without being disturbed at 5.30 when they're emptying these things. <clears throat> On the traffic, the traffic is a major concern also because the driveway to Andrews property is about 100 feet up the road. And the, with the current turning uh, radiuses and the fences and things that are there, including a six-foot vent that's going to be running up to the street from the other property, the site visibilities are hindered and the traffic is heavy and it gets very heavy during the summertime uh, when they all back up the light and then there's uh, even spacing and it's very impossible to get out. Uh, with the additional 13 turns into the property from the left, I, I think that's kind of a low number if this restaurant's going to succeed. Having 13 customers within an hour and a half or so making a left-hand turn is not going to uh, be an economic basis for the success of a, uh, a restaurant or food service. But I think listening to the discussion tonight, having that entrance, it's a very, one, it's a very narrow driveway, and having a car coming out and a car turning in is going to slow down traffic on Ocean House Road. I think having that be a one-way entrance from Ocean House Road through to the parking lot, exiting on the school, will help alleviate the traffic concerns a little bit. But the, right now, exiting Andrews Driveway can be dangerous at certain times of the day, particularly when the traffic's backed up in that middle lane, taking a left onto the school and exiting in uh, during uh, sporting events and other functions. And the school seems to be a place of uh, a lot of functions. Let me see what else I had. Okay, we do ask public comment to be limited to three minutes. You're up to about five, so if you could kind of wrap up. We do have your letter, and I, and I think we've... All right, let me just see if there's something else that was important. I started to highlight them. The elevation of the patio was a concern. The additional buffering is very important to us. Uh, can I see the patio yeah. profile on the uh, architectural side to see what that looks like towards the house? Hang on a second. Uh, I, I guess I'd have to raise a procedural question. A public hearing is not an interactive thing. If you have yep. questions you want to leave I, for us, I, that would be fine. And then after you finish, we can ask the applicant okay, to address so I things could, in so more I detail. See that. Thank you. Just look at this for a second. I think I've, the letter is in pretty good detail. I think I've summarized it and reemphasized the important aspects of that. This is the residential house. The only one close by is one across the street and that just sold. It's too bad we can't have 50 people here uh, advocating for our positions, but that house has been there 150 years, well before this project. Uh, it's, it'll be nice to have some economic development, but it'll also be nice to uh, make sure the place that this young family is starting out in is a nice place to live and not adversely impacted by a project that's going to create light noise and uh, maybe a dangerous situation exiting the driveway. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Hi. Good evening. My name is Kevin O'Donovan. I live at Six Chambers Road. I've been living here about 22 years, and this is probably the third project I've seen you know, proposed for this property. And, um, it's, it's we need it. It's a you know it's a good feasible project. I'm you know sorry for the abutters you know for their situation, um, but I mean this is within the guidelines of what we proposed and is part of the town center plan. I'd like to see some more economic development in our town to help this community. So thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public?
Hi, my name is Jeremy Lombardo. I live at 11 Lane Farm Road, and I just wanted to voice my support for this project. Uh, it's clear that the parties involved have done their due diligence to minimize any negative impact on the abutters and, and the, the area around this market, but it's uh, in supporting what Kevin just said. Um, you know, the town really could use a, a project like this and business like, like this locally, not only for the residents, but also for the tax revenue it will provide for the town as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Someone else about to get up there. Come on up. Hi, I'm Laura McGrath. I live at Four Heritage Court. And I wanted to support this project. I feel like it would really enhance the vibrancy of this town. I am a big local shopper. I love the IGA. I love the buzz. I love Jordan's Farm. And I just think it enhances the community feeling and the village-like feel that we're all sort of looking for and a place to bring people together. And I think it would be a wonderful um, added value to our town. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Mike Mahoney. My daughter's uh, wife and I live at One Autumn Tides Lane, which is just off of Wells Road. Um, we uh, have lived here for about 12 years. My wife grew up here. And uh, we really admire the work that this planning board has done and the town council has done to sort of enhance the quality of life for, for residents, whether it's maintaining and improving the fort, the development of the pathway, uh, the Greenbelt Trails, but I think there's been one area uh, over the years that we feel like is still a work in progress, and that's, that's the quality of, of, a, of an attractive, walkable, village-like downtown. And it's something we see in other communities, and, and we admire it a bit. And we think there's real potential. We think that there's a great opportunity with this project to provide a pillar uh, that can be part of creating that sort of close-knit, uh, feel for the town center area and, and I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't also add that uh, in these applicants I think you've really got some quality folks that will have the best interests of the town in mind at all times. We've known them for several years. Uh, I've done business with them in, in other areas and I found them to be honest and forthright and uh, always put in the, the town of Cape Elizabeth first. So uh, with that, I support the project wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Sarah Price. I live at 53 Cross Hill Road. And I just wanted to express my support for this business. Uh, the idea of this gourmet market in our town. And I thank you very much for your time on the project. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. Um, John, would you be willing to step back up here for a minute? I think at this point it would be helpful if you would perhaps review the buffering on the site uh, in terms of the neighbor's property and um, explain a bit the meaning of the photometric um, material you gave us, which I believe addresses the question about light reflecting from this property onto the adjacent property, but perhaps you could go through that. Right. Okay. With regard <laughs> to the light fixtures, um, and it's, these are all noted on the drawings. They all contain, except for the town center fixtures, the two out front, um, the seven LED fixtures all contain cutoff shields. And that is what is providing us with the um, zero foot candle right along this property line. Okay. It's because of those cutoff shields that are installed in the, the lenses. Um, With regard to the buffering, uh, as the board members know from the site visit, uh, these are mature, uh, evergreen uh, spruce, uh, fir trees, I, guess. I think they're fir trees. And it is true that some of the lower limbs um, are, are, you know, have been either removed or they've died. But if you look at them, and I have photographs that we can show, 
um, the limbs uh, that are growing are to the top of the uh, top of the fence. So it, I mean, it, that that row of evergreen trees is a very effective, uh, very dense uh, screening and buffering. Uh, with that said, we are also, as I mentioned, we're providing a new six-foot high stockade fence, um, which is effective in terms of noise. We're providing additional vegetation uh, along this narrow strip of uh, lawn area. It's a mix of uh, deciduous and evergreen shrubs. Um, we're providing uh, a row of flowering deciduous uh, trees between the roadway and the patio. Um, the patio, as I mentioned, has a lattice-style fence uh, surrounding a portion of the circular wall uh, in which we're going to uh, grow a hydrangea, a climbing hydrangea. Um, as well as the distance. I mean, the distance from here to the residence is, is, is approximately 130 feet. Uh, we've met the buffer standard. Um, I believe that, um, in, in, plus the patio is, it, it's designed as, it's about a 20 by 30 foot area, which is approximately, uh, you, you find many residences that have that, that size patio. Um, the hours of operation for this establishment is going to be somewhere between 7 and 7.30 at night. It will close. Um, the patio is, will accommodate approximately four uh, tables comfortably. So uh, it's in our, our opinion is that we have met the buffer standard. Are there permanent tables intended for that no. patio? No. No. Okay. This is a seasonal patio. Could you show us on the plan where the fence drops down? Will the new fence drop in height? Well, well I know the existing one. Right ones. now, it drops from six to, I believe, four feet right in this corner here. Um, our intention is to carry that out. I, I'm not sure. The, the horizontal distance, uh, I think there are, there are two panels um, before it starts to drop. Uh, we're going to extend it out one more panel. Um, so there'll be a little That'll bit be. more screening uh, okay. in that corner. Um, but you're dropping it down for visibility. I'm guessing you're you're visibility. You're, you're maintaining yes. some of the drop down yes. for the traffic yes. visibility. Yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of the sign lighting, uh, these are very small uplight uh, fixtures that will illuminate uh, the sign. Um, I believe that they can be put on a timer, so we, we can address that. Um, uh, the dumpster, I believe we can um, monitor the hours of operation for the loading of the dumpster. Um, I think those were, the, those were the comments that I had written down. You wouldn't have any idea what time the, the if, if I understand it properly, the dumpster is going to be accessed by the high school driveway that I assume has maintenance traffic already coming in and out for the various high school. I'm not sure where the, the, the truck will access the property. Um, I mean, they could access from Ocean House Road, come in, and, and typically these, these trucks want to come in front-loading. They're front-loading trucks, um, so they'll They'll probably want to come in here and maneuver around so that they're uh, face to the, the dumpster. But we, we purposely located that as furthest, the furthest away from the uh, residence. But in terms of the loading and unloading, we can, we can uh, make sure that that isn't in the, the real early hours of the morning. Maureen, do we have authority under the town center regulations to actually require a limitation on the time of the access of service vehicles? There's uh, nothing in the town center regulations right now that allow you to restrict hours of operation generally. Uh, several years ago, the planning board was looking at a proposal for 
a restaurant and the hours of operation were, were under question. And the advice you received from your town attorney was that um, there's nothing that says you cannot regulate hours of operation if they're going beyond what normally would occur. But if you are regulating the hours of operation such that a business cannot operate, then you would be going beyond what you're allowed. So for example, if a restaurant is intending to hold dinner and dinner is part of what makes it a viable business and you say it has to close at 8 o'clock, it doesn't make it possible for them to really be able to serve dinner and that would be under question. If you wanted to tell a 24-hour convenience store that they had to close at 1, you probably would have the legal ability to do that. So there's nothing specifically that gives you any, any rights on hours of operation. Um, there's some indication from our attorney that you might have some authority, but it's really only at the fringes. Is there not a time where you're allowed to start working in the morning, for example, cut the grass or make the noise? No. No, you can, you, as a homeowner, you can cut grass by the light of the moon if you want. No, but I mean service. But construction equipment, there, yeah. yeah, there is construction limits. Um, if you're building a road or if you're building a house or something, I think, I think it's 6 a.m. It's, pretty, it's a pretty early hour, pretty but it's early. in the construction ordinance, so it's a completely separate ordinance. You really have nothing to do with that ordinance. But yes, construction activities are regulated. Uh, mowing your grass is not. So this is not part of that? <coughs> now, we... There are some areas where we don't know how far you can go until you try it and you get sued. And I, you know, I kind of encourage you not to go to that extreme, but it's your call. So if we wanted to say no commercial service vehicles before 4 a.m., we're probably earlier than 4 a.m., we're probably very safe. I feel comfortable that you're good there. <laughs> but if we wanted to say no commercial service vehicles earlier than 7 a.m., we might not be because if a store opens at 7, they may have legitimate business reasons for needing their commercial vehicles out of there by seven. I see commercial vehicles right in front track. of CVS okay. at 5.30 in the morning. Excuse me? I see commercial vehicles in front of CVS at 5.30 in the morning, loading and unloading. And, and CVS is in the same zoning and, district as this yeah. project. Right. And I guess I wouldn't feel comfortable restricting the dumpster hours. I feel like we can address um, the noise concerns with the buffering, but I, I guess I just feel like that's above and beyond what we're required to do in the ordinance, restricting when the dumpster can be serviced. I guess, what is the dumpster made of? Has it got a rubber door or a steel door? Plastic. Typically they're plastic. It isn't that noisy, but if it has a steel door, it's noisy. Right. The truck's noisy. Sorry? The truck can be noisy. Carol Ann? I'll just throw this out. As a business owner who has deliveries by large vehicles uh, from companies who are willing to come as long as the sun is up, uh, out of respect for our neighbors, we have asked them to conform to certain hours. But that's totally on us. It's nothing that anyone has said has to happen. And so I think we could leave it up to respectful property owners to deal with that um, as the, you know, as, as good neighbors and ask, you're, you're my service provider, I'm going to ask that you come, you should restrict yourself to these hours. I don't think, by the sounds of things, the planning board has authority to do that. Okay. John, do you have any thought about the kinds, I know people tend to disregard signs, but I've observed at gas stations and various corner locations that they do put up signs that say something to the effect of no pass-through only traffic. Um, if we wanted some kind of signage on the access to the high school to make it clear that we were asking that this not be used as a pass-through, do you have any suggestion what kind of language might work? Have you had experience with that? A lot of times it's like not a through way. Um, you can do no cut through traffic, that sort of thing. And obviously at that point you're relying on just the driver to be courteous. Um, that's not going to be a, a something that's going to eliminate necessarily. But I think it's, 
it informs people and makes them think about it. So it, it's uh, certainly worthwhile. Okay. I'm curious how other people on the board feel about this. I, I don't think a sign's going to be enough. And I think it's going to create a dangerous traffic situation with people cutting through and um, creating another point of egress and ingress onto 77. I think we need something more than a sign. I guess we want to go through because I think we may have some like differing what? opinions. On like um, a speed bump or um, what I would do is I would do um, ingress from 77 only and then I would do ingress and egress and I would do a wider uh, curb cut um, onto the high school road. So and no I would egress. extend it to, to the left. No egress onto 77? No. Right or left? Nope. Okay. And only go in. Um, how about if we kind of go through and see if we have any kind of consensus on this? Does anyone else um, want to do that kind of restriction? I'll go. <laughs> I feel that uh, doing that, I would assume, calls for narrowing up the driveway and uh, to try and make it more visible that this is only one way to get in and one way to get out. And I feel that uh, those people who are going to ignore and cut through are going to ignore that as well. And they're going to go in the out and out the in. Any other? No, I think if you're going to, uh, if you're going to put restrictions on the input of the output, I don't think it will work. I mean, um, if you're going to make it in one way and out the other, it would work, but um, the other is just uh, trying to paste onto something. That, so I would leave the two, the two entrances as they are, egress and exit on both, both entrances. Would you add a speed bump? No, certainly not. Yeah, to me, speed bumps will do the same thing a little more slowly. <laughs> right? yeah. Okay, so it looks like we don't have the votes for that proposal. Is anyone else other than me interested in putting a sign there? I think it's up any value. Signage is fine. Hmm. Pardon? Signage is fine. So no additional signage? Signage, I mean signage would be fine. It's yeah. okay yeah, to do signage. You're saying what, Elaine? The, uh, no, just on the high school driveway. No cut through? Requesting no cut through, yeah. right? No, I think that'd be a good idea. Is that acceptable to the applicant? Put a no cut through type sign on the high school driveway? I'm just curious. So what happens if we have a few accidents? <laughs> Can the town mandate any changes? The town could monitor the town's high school driveway. But the so high school drivers coming out of the high school parking lot are the responsibility of the town. So I, I would think that it could, but probably not put subsequent requirements on this property owner. I would think that if you have one or two accidents, you're going to have to just accept that's just, it could be the part of doing business. I don't know how many accidents they have in the IGA parking lot. But if there was a string of problems, I think the town could make the argument that part of the site plan approval needs to be looked at again. Either it's been violated or something. So, I mean, but I think you would need a pretty extreme situation. So there's something we could write into the site plan approval? No, I'm just saying you could just leave it the way it is. I mean, the applicant has made representations that it's not going to be a serious cut through. Um, he's made representations about how much peak hour traffic can be expected at various intersections. And if that traffic study is, is woefully out of line, dramatically wrong, and knowing Tom, it's not. Um, but I think you could make the case that we need to bring the applicant back in. But I do think that's an extreme situation. So would you put something in your findings of fact then? It's up to the board to decide. Town that option. It's to determine. I guess I'm reluctant to impose on any particular property owner the responsibility to monitor traffic from the high school through their private property. I would think they would have their own reasons for maintaining a safe parking lot. Um, I'm not inclined to mandate 
that they do that. It seems to me it would be in their interest to put in a speed bump if high schoolers were racing through their property. Yeah, but not after hours. No, actually, ask their liability insurer. They're, they have liability for unsafe or potential liability for accidents on their property. It, it would seem to me that you've only got a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of an hour or so in the morning and an hour or so in the evening when the school road is heavily used or is peak time that you have any of these problems at all. So for a couple of hours a day, I don't really see um, there being a major problem. After all, everybody's trying to get to school at roughly the same sort of time and they're all wanting to leave at roughly the same sort of time. So they're either going to behave or they're not. There's, there's no intermediary way. I, you know, speed bump won't help, I don't think. I mean, that, it seems that having an entry and an exit that can be used either way, or the two entrances that can be used either way, egress and access and, and, and exit, seems the, the most obvious way to do, allow the traffic to flow as freely as possible. Having listened to the presentation from the I, over there. I support uh, Elaine's position. Mm. Yeah, I'm clearly in the minority. <laughs> oh, I, I think the no cut through the sign is, is the best we can do under the circumstances. Okay. Anyone have any other yeah, questions? I have some plan? other is comments it? about the plan, which is um, buffering. So, um, you know, I feel like the buffering is um, per the ordinance. It's the onus is definitely on um, the applicant, and I don't think that the applicant um, has has met it as well um, as they could have with the buffering. I think the um, climbing hydrangeas and the fence are great. The new fence to, in the extension of the six foot part is great too. But um, I would like to see some more evergreens and the evergreens that are there are on the abutters side so again the onus is on the applicant not on the abutter to do the screening um, i think it given the constraints of the site it was a really innovative solution um, to put the rhododendron on the abutters land and it seems like that should suffice um, and um, i guess I mean, I don't, I don't think the applicant has, has done enough, but um, uh, given that the butter seems to have agreed to have the rhododendrons on their land, I guess I'm just, I'm not sure what more you want the applicant to do given that the evergreens are now going to be on, you're going to have more evergreens on your property. So it seemed like a good solution, but I, I don't know, I guess I just want it for the record that the onus is really on the applicant to have, for the buffering to be on the applicant side. And I think you could put more evergreens on, on, the, on, uh, on the, um, the border, the property there. Uh, so I don't, I, do, does that, how does everyone else feel about the buffering? Anybody else? Do you think it's adequate, the deciduous buffering? Well, it is a commercial zone. I mean, it's not like, I mean, I, apart from possibly adding another foot or two onto the height of the fence, I can't see what else. Yeah, but have you read the ordinance? I mean, where there's a change in use, you've got to have buffering. I mean, apart And the buffering's all in the abutters land, it seems, most of it. What's that? But I mean, if it was... Is, if it was a commercial unit on the right, on instead of a, uh, a property, there would would we wouldn't be saying the same thing, right? We would say I mean, we wouldn't it, be absolutely. It's only because it's a change in use. Yeah. So what would you like to see? I mean, I apart from extending the height of the fence, maybe to eight feet, yeah. or seven foot, or something. I guess nothing. I feel like now that the, the neighbor has said, you know, you agreed to have rhododendrons. I, I guess I'm okay with it, but. Um, I guess I don't know what else you want. Oh. No, actually, not. Yeah. In, in dialogue. But they seem unhappy with it. And I was, what, how do the other planning board members feel? I mean, it seems the substantive concern is noise and sight line from the patio. I haven't seen a drawing of what somebody sitting in the patio would see uh, of the neighbor's house, but 
I think there was indication that there is a wall on the patio, although I don't know to what extent it, it would screen people sitting there. There is some, I think, deciduous trees planted around the patio. Yes. I suppose some evergreen shrubs around the patio would provide more year-round buffering. On the other hand, in the winter, is there are no not going to be people out on the patio. Right. So. Um, you know, but this is the driveway, too, that's getting buffered, not just the patio. Well, the concern I heard uh, was primarily the patio. Yeah, and I the think the driveway buffering, the concern was mostly light. And I actually think the fence is going to buffer the light of the cars pretty well. But our job isn't just to um, address the concerns of the abutters. It's to enforce the ordinance. So. The ordinance says we need to provide buffering between the driveway and the um, right, abutting different use. The, the right, and so we shouldn't only be concerned with the patio. No, I, I think the buffering along the, along the property line has been addressed with, and, and just because the rhododendrons or the, there's a planting going on to the, the abutter's property, the abutter agreed to that. The, um, the applicant is the one who's responsible for paying for that and making sure it's happened. So the onus is on the, on, the, on the applicant. What I heard in Randy's presentation was, was more along the light, which I believe has been addressed, and, and then the buffering on the patio, where they suggest trying to get more buffering onto the patio in order to make sure that the noise is reduced. And that's where I heard that the concern still exists. This is the view approximately where the patio is, is located looking towards the residence. Um, and keep, please keep in mind that this patio is going to have, I, I keep mentioning this lattice fence. This is a lattice style fence, six feet high, <clears throat> that's going to be located on top of the patio. Uh, we have with, a picture of that. Is that part of the application, I, or is that just your? It's it's on the plan, but it, there's no there's no is a height illustration. Too? Um, I'm not sure, but but it it will be six feet high. It's a very decorative lattice style fence, um, and so w when you're sitting on the patio, you're not going to be able to, at least in the summertime, you're not going to be able to see through that lattice fence once the vine is established. How, how high is that existing fence we're looking at in that? That's, that's six feet. That's six feet. So yes. it's going to be just the, that. And we would, we would be very opposed to, to putting in an eight-foot high fence. I mean, that's, it's not from the cost point of view, but they're just ugly. Yeah. Uh, but you can see that. Um, my comment when I made the, uh, the lower limbs, um, it is true that a lot of the lower limbs have, have been removed or have died, but the limbs that are there are at the, uh, the height of the fence. Okay. Uh, so so you're, looking through, you're looking at this lattice style fence if you're sitting on the patio. Then you have four deciduous flowering trees. Then you have additional plants in front of the fence, and then you have the fence, and then you have the trees. So I'm, I'm just looking on the plans to find that six-foot lattice fence to make sure that it's actually part of the site plan approval. Yes. Um, let's see. If you look on the planting plan. On the planting plan? Okay. detail on the wall or the lattice fence on the patio. I know we've been talking about it, but which, what page number is it? Where does it say that six feet? It doesn't. 
this is the primary hydrangea that we can place in that space. And you referred to both a stone wall and then a lattice fence. So I would think we could make as, a con as an additional condition that the plan reflect that there will be a stone wall and a six foot high fence around the front edge of the patio. Is a height on it? Yes, here is a height. Yeah. Replace fence with new six foot high. No, sorry. No. This one right here. Layout and lighting plan. It's Layout and lighting retaining wall. Oh, yeah. And Layout and lighting plan. Oh, okay. That's sheet number two. Stone retaining wall. Doesn't say what height. And the six foot lattice is on top of the retaining wall? Or yes, on the top. <laughs> so then we would want to add a note to the layout and lighting plan. The stone retaining wall, there's a drawing on it on sheet number six. And when it shows that on the side of the Okay, so how would we describe six feet from where? Since that seems to be on a slope. From the top of the wall. From the top of the wall. Okay, so that would be an additional condition that there would be a fence six feet high on the top of the stone retaining wall on the patio as shown on page six and sheet six. L lattice. Style. Lattice fence. Yes. I'm just. Is it, is it always going to be lattice? <laughs> do we want to say lattice or do we want to just say fence? I guess to say screening fence. You know, I know the applicant mentioned this, and, I, and you know, you're free to ignore me here, but. It says that the purpose of this district is to encourage an identifiable town center that includes a village feeling, mixed retail and residential uses to serve residents, an environment inviting to pedestrians, a common meeting place. This patio is a great opportunity to create a common meeting place. And it would be nice if we didn't wall it in completely, because it would be nice to be able to see it from the road, to see people. Well, it's yeah. not walled in completely. Well, but if you're required to put a six foot high lattice fence in Evergreens, it's going to feel like it's completely walled in. Uh, and I, that's, I, that's my point is I that I think you have proposed something that creates an enclosure, but if we're going for something that's completely opaque, you're going to lose that sense of a common meeting place. Yeah, but, but if, you look at, if you look at the design, the, the lattice style fence only goes uh, on a portion of that circular wall, and then it's open on either side. I wonder if we could add a depiction of the six-foot lattice fence to the elevation drawings. Would that? We, we could, um, I think what would be a little easier for the applicant is if we just required a detail, because you've got details of the stone wall and you could have a separate detail that actually shows a lattice fence. Mm -hmm. um, and you could specify that a lattice fence will be located on top of the stone wall. Do you know, is it the entire curve? No, the limits are shown on the planting plan. Okay, so okay. we could just say that the detail be added to the plan that shows the six foot high lattice fence where it's located on top of the stone wall. I guess, and the I extent of it is as you see. Right. The so it's, circumference, not the circumference, the curve is as shown on the planting plan. I'd be willing to leave that out if we could get some um, more evergreen shrubs as um, we, directed by the ordinance. And I just want to read the ordinance to everybody here. Okay, these are application st uh, standards, or approval standards for site plan review. This is under 19-9N, um, landscaping and buffering. The development shall also provide for the buffering of adjacent uses where there is a transition from one type of use to another use and for screening of service and storage areas. Required parking and loading spaces for non-residential uses in multiplex housings were not enclosed within a building shall be effectively screened from view by a continuous landscape area not less than eight feet in width containing evergreen shrubs, trees, fences, wall, berms, um, and any combination thereof. 
forming a visual barrier of not less than six feet in height along exterior lot lines adjoining all residential properties. So I know it says this, you know, um, walls or shrubs, but I just think it talks about eight feet in width. And we don't have an eight foot in width barrier. We don't have eight feet to play with, but I just think that there could be more evergreen shrubs. Is this along in the that town center zone? Property. Yeah. This is in the town center zone? Yep. And the, so this is know. actually in the ordinance for um, site plan so, review. Yeah. But we have so, like approval standards. So, like pedestrian circulation, stormwater management, erosion control, sewage, sewage disposal. So, I, I would be willing to not um, specify anything for the patio. I don't know how an applicant would feel about that, but just have more buffering along the edge. Okay, let's see if we have a consensus here because we have two different proposals and it ultimately it comes to a vote. I think the two thoughts are that we require more evergreen planting on the applicant's land where it abuts the residential property. The other <coughs> suggestion is that we require the applicant to show detail of the applicant's proposed lattice fencing along the stone wall at the edge of the patio. So starting with Liza's proposal, is there anyone else who would like to pursue the approach of requiring more evergreen plants? Can I ask Liza what you have in mind though? I mean, where and how big? Because it's on the applicant side, you have the six foot fence, which visually I think kind of takes care of your problem. Yeah. Putting evergreens on the applicant side isn't doing much for the abutter, because they won't, they won't see them until they grow over six feet high. Or are you talking about big? Or I don't know what, what type, and, and maybe the driveway needs to be moved, but I just feel like the ordinance is pretty strong. and saying you need a really wide buffer of evergreens and berms and fences that I don't think this plan has. Anyone else? Yeah. You? It's whirling in my head. It's just not ready to come out yet. I just I I guess I'm visual and I'm, I'm stuck on the patio part. Um, I happen to think from my perspective, a seasonal patio that has a, a, a knee wall for uh, it's probably two feet high and uh, a six foot lattice that has a climbing plant on it is more visually appealing and probably just as much of a noise buffer as a bunch of uh, evergreens around the patio or in proximity to the patio, uh, which it does not propose a winter use. Um, you'd still have the lattice, you'd still have the wall, you just wouldn't have the, the flowers. So um, I guess I'm not hung up on evergreens. I, I don't see it. Anyone else? OK. What about the idea? How, how many people think that we should require some detailed drawings of the lattice. Do we have a consensus on that one? Joe? Unless I can understand. Oh, that's right. You're recused. Sorry. Me. Forgot. Okay. <laughs> I don't see a need to have a, a drawing of it. I, think it's, I don't either, even if we don't get shrubs. <laughs> oh, no. I don't think we should have shrubs. I think a, a lattice work is fine, but I don't think it needs detailing on, on the drawing, particularly. So I guess there are three of us who are inclined to put a detailing of the lattice that's been described. And since there are one, two, three, four, five of us voting, you whoever makes the motion might want to include that or not. <laughs> <laughs> OK, do we have any other issues? Would anyone like to make a motion? Take a minute to think about it. Elaine, is the, the substance of the motion that there will be a lattice of six feet high from the top of the retaining wall and that it shall be shown on the plans in some? The detail, detail. of it would be on the plan, yeah. So 
it's got to be there, and, and, you, and you want it shown in the plans. The two things. That's the idea. Yeah, the idea of that. You want to make a motion? Sure. Okay. Good, Brad. Um, so I think we've got the. Just four. throw some words together and see what. Well, we've got the entire. Uh, we oh, have the, the whole thing. project here. Oh, whole well, thing. Peter, if you want to start with page four of the memo and then just kind of add in, add conditions once you get past the motion part. Okay. Um, I need to have the right piece of paper here. Okay, this is the uh, yeah. starting with findings of fact? Yes, starting with findings of fact. Uh, okay. Um, findings of fact. One, KMC LLC is requesting the site plan review of C's Gourmet Market, a new retail 28-seat restaurant office building proposed to be located at 349 Ocean House Road, which requires review under Section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two, the town engineer is recommending that the fence detail included in the plan materials be added to the plan set detail sheet. The tree preservation information should also be added to the plan set. Maureen, you want to stick something in there about the... Uh, sure. Um, you, but you don't... You know what? I think you're fine there. This is just... Well, that's a, findings. a finding of fact. Yeah, you, when with. you get to the condition, definitely <coughs> right. do it. I think this finding will support the condition I think you're going to add. Okay. Three, uh, placement of the sidewalk partially in applicant's property necessitates the provision of an easement. <coughs> Um, for public access. Four, the applicant has requested that lighting levels in excess of 5.5 foot candles be allowed at the project entrance driveway. And five, the application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations subject to the submission of information reference in the two of them. And Find back. No, I, the I think, back I think in you connection could, with what we've discussed. Yeah, I think what you would want to do now is go with the motion. Okay. And then add it, and, and then take condition number five and make it condition number six, and add a new condition number five. Right. Okay. Uh, therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of KMC LLC for site plan review of C's Gourmet Market, a new, re <coughs> excuse me, a new retail 28-seat restaurant office building proposed to be located at 349 Ocean House Road be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to add a detail of the wood fence and tree preservation plan information. And a six-foot lattice fence to be erected on the top of the semicircular retaining wall around the patio. You got the, do you have the link on? Okay. Uh, two, that the applicant provide a signed public access easement for the sidewalk in a form acceptable to the town attorney. Three, that the lighting plan be revised to limit uh, lighting levels at the property line to no more than 0 0.5 foot candles. Four, that a performance guarantee be provided in a form acceptable to the town attorney, uh, not acceptable to the town engineer, and all acceptable to the town manager. <clears throat> Five. Um, you may be all set because okay. you've added it under one. Well, that's that, that's that's yeah. I mean, the, the number one spoke of it in terms of the plans, but that basically will then create the obligation to have it. Okay. Okay. Well, then uh, five. That there be no issuance of a building permit, no alteration of the site. <coughs> Excuse me until the plans are revised and the above conditions are met. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Carol. I want to consider an amendment to the findings of fact, just for the record. 
okay. that the applicant represents that there will be no materially adverse safety or flow impact to automobile traffic. No. Okay, I guess nobody picked up on that one. Okay. I have a question. There's no reference in here to the need for an, an easement from the town to provide access off the driveway, and there is no such easement that I can find expressly referenced on the plan. It seems to me like we need to reference that also as a requirement. It, it, I, I was at the meeting on uh, last Wednesday night where the council formally voted to grant the easement to the applicant. So I know it exists, but if you want to um, have some a condition in here that memorializes that, there's nothing wrong with it. We and wouldn't we that kind of easement others, normally? We require it from other. It would normally have to be shown on the so plan. Okay. All right. So you would want that that the plan show the applicant provide a copy of an easement from the Cape Elizabeth town, from the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, for the installation of utilities and access to the high school driveway, and that that easement be shown on the plans. You accept that to an, as an amendment to your yes, I do. motion? Yes, yep. Carol, you accept that to the second? Okay, so the motion is amended. But it wasn't made by me, it was made by Mr. It was, Curry. Right, he, yeah. he adopted it. Right, right. <laughs> I agree to everything you said, right? He's writing furious. What she said. And that would be condition number five. Yes. Okay. And so the former five is now six. Okay. Exactly. You got it. Any other comments? So I think we're ready to vote. Um, there are five of us voting. All in favor of the motion. The five of us voting are unanimous. So that concludes the matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have one more item on our agenda tonight, if I can find our agenda. Could, could I make one request? Yes. I'd, I'd like to ask the Minute Secretary to reflect that Mr. Shalott uh, expressed his intent to recuse himself from the prior item. I'm stuck to it tonight. <laughs> Awful quiet down there, Joe. Wait. Once you retreat, you, you have to do it every... Uh, it's best to do it every meeting. Oh. But I, I mean, okay. you, you, you did it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you'd unintroduce yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I wish well, they could have. Okay, the next item on our agenda, survey zoning amendment. The town council has forwarded to the planning board a request to review an amendment to the zoning ordinance that would require a standard boundary survey for a structure within five feet of a setback line. Section 191013, zoning ordinance amendments, public hearing. Um, looks like everyone is leaving the room so that we, so that's fine. <laughs> We're on another note. We're on another matter now. Okay. Um, Yeah, why don't you give us a summary, Martin? Just a, a one-minute summary. Uh, the town council has had a concern because they had to deal with a situation in February where a structure had been, an addition had been placed too close to the setback line. Um, a variance was not an option. The only way to cure the title defect was for the town to actually file suit and then settle the suit. Um, it was expensive for the property owners. The council was uncomfortable with that procedure. And so the ordinance committee has drafted an amendment to the zoning ordinance that would require, if you are applying for a building permit for a structure that's worth $10,000 or more, uh, and your structure is proposed to be within five feet of the minimum setback, you would be required to provide a standard boundary survey before you could get a building permit. Maureen. Yes, sir. You said that the council also had the option of uh, ordering them to tear down the addition, right? Yes, they did. And, and well, yes. And we actually have instances, not, in, not specifically as to this, but there are instances where people have had to tear down portions of their structure because they did not meet setbacks. Thank you. 
Okay, well, we have spent time discussing this in workshops and at a prior meeting, so although there is no one sitting in front of me from the public, I think formally, because this is an ordinance amendment, we are required to open and then proceed and close the public hearing. So I will now formally open the public hearing on this zone ordinance amendment. Seeing no one present, I will again close the public hearing. So we have attended to that detail. Um, does anyone on the planning board have anything else they would like to address with question. respect to what this? What sort yes. of cost is a, a um, boundary cost to do? I mean, officially with a survey, if you like. It, it does vary, and the ordinance committee did get several, um, we got several different proposals, different estimates. It looks like it's probably a two to three thousand dollar cost item. The uh, property owner does have the option if they can just survey one line, um, that would be acceptable. However, sometimes even if you can just survey one line, you need to get all the other lines of your property in order to make it close and be certain that that one line is in the same place. But there is a little bit of flexibility there for a partial standard boundary survey. So yeah, my other question is, and probably because I don't know, when, mm -hmm. you buy, when you purchase property, do you not have the accurate property lines defined no. somewhere? And that, that was what typically when you uh, buy a property, uh, you have to require, you usually get financing and you get something called a mortgage inspection plan. Right. And the ordinance committee did look at that and the reality is that mortgage inspection plans are not um, reliable enough for people who are making large investments in their property. A lot of the situations we looked at, people did have mortgage inspection plans. And they, they, Morgan Inspection Plan doesn't require research. It doesn't even require finding property. <coughs> it usually means they go to the site and they walk around. And there, there may be some additional work. I don't want to minimize the amount of effort people put into Morgan Inspections Plans. But there are people who are investing, you know, upwards of $100,000 um, in additions that are then built too close to the property wow. line. And if you start calculating the percentage of that investment versus what it would have cost to get this, the standard boundary survey, the, the ordinance committee was very, very concerned that they were adding to cost. But the thing is, they felt very strongly that having to go to court and then settle the court costs was more expensive than just getting a boundary survey. So I guess my last question is, assuming you want to build and the boundary line is uh, an unknown accurately, um, in other words, how would you know that you required that you were within the five feet? Uh, you could be within seven feet and not require it, but if it was an in inaccurate line, you're within the five feet and now you're in trouble. You, the code, you need to still present information to the code enforcement officer uh, and you could use a mar mortgage inspection plan to show that you are more than five feet from the setback line. Obviously, without the, without the survey, you're, you're still in this kind of gray area. Well, that's why the five foot number was picked. I mean, the, the idea was where we looked at, where we looked at situations where people had encroached on their setback, most of them, they were within that five foot limit. So the idea is that five feet gives you a, a margin of error. If you want to build right on the setback, you really have to be confident that you have your property line in the right place. If you want to save the cost of a of a survey, you can pull your project five feet back from your survey line, and the hope is that you won't be, your error, potential error will not exceed five feet. And so the it's a compromise. Would at some stage say before or after the building was done, I think you ought to check it? No, usually the, <coughs> it's the, the, usually the problem does not come up when the code enforcement looks at it, it's when you try to sell the property. and. Um, your buyer gets a mortgage inspection plan or a survey and they discover that, in fact, you are in violation of local setback rules. So there would be that the first mortgage inspection was different from the second mortgage inspection because they would do it on, based on some mortgage. Some plans. people are actually doing surveys. When they buy a house. Yes, and, and what, the situation I mentioned in February was the abutter was, had done a survey in preparation for a home sale and then discovered that the line was not where they thought it was and kicked, that kicked the, um, the person with the new addition, well, not a new addition, into um, nonconformance. Maureen, when, um, when the town goes to court to resolve these issues, 
with um, somebody who's violated the ordinance, can they recover their court costs? They do. Legally? They did. And it, okay. it, the only reason the town ended up going to court was it was the only op option open to them short of tearing down the addition to cure the problem. And so they, it was actually the property owner who had to bear the costs of the town's time to file suit and then settle the suit. Um, it was much more expensive than just getting a survey like five times more expensive. And Maureen, how did they come up with the $10,000 threshold? It was, I mean, this was the ordinance committee trying to reach a reasonable compromise. They didn't want to have to, they didn't want to require property owners to have to get a standard boundary survey to put in a shed. Um, you do have to get a permit to get a shed, to build a shed. You have to meet the setbacks. And so 10,000 was for exempting the deluxe shed. Maureen, the condition 1A, I really think, ought to be deleted. Uh, I don't know whose doubt drives the uh, application of the uh, requirement. And then he just talks about a, not being able to locate a property line without regard to whether there's a structure anywhere near it. And that could be a back property line, you know, 100 yards from anything. It just, 1A just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, 1A and 1B are existing language. And if you look up in paragraph 1, you'll see that the stuff that's struck out is what we carried down into a list form in A and B. So, you know, yes, we can take it out, but there's, there's always this kind of resistance to taking out something that's already in there that mm -hmm. has served us well or ill. Um, yeah, uh, I hear yeah. it just doesn't make any sense. Um, one, one other question, the um, code enforcement officer's discretion to require a, um, a standard boundary survey within the area of the um, proposed construction rather than the entire property? Correct. Uh, but it talks about a standard boundary survey quality plan of only the property lines, actually the standard um, boundary survey deals with more than property lines. It deals with easements, um, rights of way, existing structures, et cetera. So that seemed to say that all they had to, he could just say all you have to do is just show a property line. Well, actually the intent of that provision is to refer, we have added a definition for standard boundary survey because we determined that, well, we'd, we've learned that um, the professional surveyors of the state used to have a definition of standard boundary survey that they abandoned in the, in the mid-2000s. Right. So we had to come up with one. We drafted this one. It is very close to what they used to use. It has not required the placement of monumentation. Um, no, 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 but so the intent on, uh, below was to say that you could do just one property line, but the quality of the information that you use to, to establish that one property line has to be a standard boundary survey type quality. That was the intent. Oh, okay. I, I, so thought, that, it, I, yeah. I, I thought it contradicted the, what, what I think is a really good definition, where it said only the property line. I thought that was contradicting what yeah, the, the, the broader scope. Yeah, but the standard plan. boundary survey quality plan, which is supposed to refer back to the standard boundary survey <laughs> definition, and then of only the property line within the area. Okay, well, you're comfortable that it does require all the other data that has to be on the plan. Yes, I do. I am, I, you know, I'm not the code officer, so I will not be interpreting this, but when we drafted it, that was the intent, and, and the code officer understood that was the intent. Okay. I guess I kind of agree with Peter on the concern on subpart A because mm -hmm. if there isn't a standard boundary survey, there is by definition doubt as to location of the property line. Whether and so that the, the code officer hasn't taken that position. The code officer's position was that he would he would put the burden of providing accurate information on the applicant and that it was the applicant's responsibility to make sure that property boundaries depicted on a building permit application were accurate. And what that was supposed to do is, you know, if, if they showed a line on a plan and he walked out there and said, there's no way that that distance is 15 feet when I can, you know, I can see it, that was supposed to be this kind of plain face, kind of standard 
Um, I think C is much more specific. Um, I think A is useful. What if someone is asking for a building permit for a project that is not $10,000, but the code officer has doubt that the information presented is accurate? I guess my question is if who has doubt, because mm. from a, if you're asking whether from a lawyer's perspective there is doubt, there's always doubt if there's not a standard boundary survey. If you're giving the code enforcement officer the discretion to determine that he has doubt, then I think we should clarify A to say if the code enforcement officer determines that there is doubt. Or the code enforcement officer has doubt. Or if the code enforcement officer has doubt. So instead of there is, we would say the code enforcement officer has determines. doubt. I would say he determines yeah, that there is doubt. I don't know how he can determine without, without knowing. I mean, he just suspect. I don't think he can determine. Concludes. Yeah, <laughs> the code enforcement that. concludes that there is doubt, so that it's, it's his subjective determination, not a legal determination. Okay, so just to go over this on line A, under paragraph 1, it would say the code enforcement officer concludes there is doubt that as to the location. Doubt. Yeah, concludes that there is doubt. And then the next one would be the code enforcement officer cannot confirm. So I think, I think with that, does that address your concern? Yeah, it does, yeah. Um, so what about the scenario where, say I, um, I get a boundary survey for my house and it's on a piece of paper, and then um, I sell my house but I don't give the boundary survey to the people who bought it, and then um, they do an addition over $10,000, and there's monumentation in the ground, but they don't have a paper, there's monumentation in the ground, but they don't have a paper survey. Are they going to have to spend two to three thousand dollars to get their property surveyed again? Yes. If they're, with, if they're within and, five feet. And let's be clear, I mean, we're talking about additions that are sixty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in value. There's not a lot of ten thousand dollar additions out there. So if you, if you're putting in an addition that's worth over a hundred thousand dollars, you're looking at a very small percentage of that to verify that you're in fact putting it where it can legally be constructed. Because the other option is to tear it down. Yeah. I just feel like if we're protecting people against themselves, we should require that the surveyor monuments the corners of the buildings. Because we know from your anecdotes, um, Maureen, in Cross Hill, where the properties were surveyed, there were still mistakes made about where the buildings went. Well, the, so I mean, I, one of the problems is... I feel is, like we're making people yeah. spend money, but we're not actually But, but in those problems. subdivisions, you know, the <laughs> subdivider is required to monument the corners of the, of the lots. And then people go in and they build their dream homes and they build their driveways and they landscape. And sometimes those pins get knocked out of place. I mean, they, they get buried or we don't know what happens to them. So, you know, the monumentation, I don't... You, if you require monumentation, you're adding to the cost of the standard boundary survey. I know. I realize that. I just think that it would make uh, it more meaningful if you're going to require something. Well, this covers it quite adequately. I mean, if somebody's going to do something like that, they're going to, they're going to look at or they're going to be told by their advisor or by the code enforcement officer, I think we're going to have to look at the boundaries on this one. And that's pretty, that's pretty definitive as far as I'm concerned. If somebody tells me you better look at the, at the boundaries, obviously if there's no reason to look at the boundaries, the determines there's no doubt about it. I'm sorry, the he or she, depending on the code enforcement officer. Um, and that's fine. You're, you're, you're to a degree fair to say. I think we're in part protecting property owners from themselves, but I think also we find that the town gets in the middle of it, and so that even though we get reimbursed for costs, it's in our interest not to have our town officials and employees spending their time on this. Um, I think this is a reasonable compromise to put people, alert people, without forcing them to spend yeah. perhaps more money than's warranted. There, there was also a member of the council, the ordinance committee, who expressed his support because this protects the integrity of your, of your ordinances. What's the point of having side and rear yard setbacks if they're going to be routinely 
not followed. <coughs> okay, any more comment on this ordinance proposal? Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion if you like. Okay, Henry? Want me to do draft amendment or just do motion for board to consider? I think it, we just need the motion. Okay, be it ordered that based on the draft amendment and the facts presented, the planning board recommends the, sur zone, the survey zoning amendment to the Cape Elizabeth Town, Town Council for consideration. We have a second. And should we add the clarifying language on 1A that you. Uh... Sorry, what did you say? Were you intending to include oh, the, yes, the yes. amendment that. As amend, as, would you like to add the language, be it ordered, that based on the draft amendment as amended? Yes. You want me to read the three, the site plan? Okay, I'll do that, application for permits. All, applica all applications for building permits shall be submitted in writing to the code enforcement officer on forms provided for the purpose. The application shall be done accompanied by the following information. One, the site plan drawn to an indicated scale and showing the location and dimensions of all buildings to be erected. The sewage disposal system, driveways and turnarounds, and the butting lot and street lines. The site plan shall accurately represent the re relationship between any proposed building or structure or addition to an existing building and all property lines to demonstrate compliance <laughs> with the setback requirements of this ordinance. The applicant shall provide a standard boundary survey if any of the following apply. A, there is doubt. That, this is where the uh, amendment that's where, yes. here. Would Remember you read that? Okay, you've re rewritten it. The code enforcement officer concludes that there is doubt. Yeah, there is doubt as to the property line on the ground. B, the code enforcement officer cannot confirm that all setback requirements are met for the information provided. Or C, the building permit is requested, is requested for a building, building additions or structure valued at over $10,000 and located less than five feet from the minimum setback distance. The code enforcement officer, officer shall have the discretion to require a standard boundary survey quality plan if only the property lines within the area of the proposed construction instead of a standard boundary survey if of the entire property boundary. Two, appro approval by local plumbing inspector of any private sewage disposal system proposed for the building together with the plans for the appro si approved system. Three, Information required to determine compliance with the terms and conditions for building and development in flood area, in flood hazard area, as set forth under Chapter 6, Article 6, Flood Plan Management Ordinance, if the building is located within a flood hazard area. 4. All applications will be signed by an owner or an individual who can show evidence of right, title, or interest in the property or by an agent of the owner with authorization from the owner to apply for a permit hereunder, certifying that the information in the, applica in, the, in the application is correct and complete, effective October 15, 2009. Such other information as the code enforcement officer may require to determine compliance with this ordinance or the building code. And uh, do you want to add the definition of standard boundary survey at the top? Yes, I don't have it, though. Do you have it? Okay, here we go. Standard boundary survey, a map of a, of a, a quant quantity of real estate prepared by a professional land surveyor registered in the state of Maine and based on one, adequate research to support a professional opinion of boundary location, two, field work including an inspection of the real estate, and three, the preparation of a plan drawn to scale and including property boundary lines Accept easements and rights of way of existing structures suitable for recording. Do we have a second? second. Joe, second? Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? That is five opposed, one. Mm -hmm. I got you didn't like the way I read it? Oh, <laughs> <lovely>. <laughs>
I was hoping you'd go all the way to six or whatever it was. <laughs> okay, that's the last item on our agenda. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs>